I think we got everybody here and we're all on Zoom so we can begin our working session meeting. So I'm going to call this meeting to order. The ONJ Roberts School District Board of Directors uh, utilizes these working sessions. And it's a process and a way to consider agenda items as one large committee for the purposes of discussion and debate and full view of the public. It's not a time for public engagement with the board, rather it's a time for the public to observe the work of the various committees. Uh, with that, um, the first item on the agenda tonight is discussion of the health and safety plan as, as we had problems, uh, promised in our last board meeting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stout. Sure, thank you, Mr. Friel. And Mr. Sanfran, can you pull my uh, presentation up? Okay, very good. Thanks, Paul. So the purpose of this, uh, of this presentation tonight is really to provide you with some, some updates regarding the COVID information uh, throughout the county and in our district, and then talk about some, some proposed changes that the administration would like to, to make to the health and safety plan. So let me start first with some information and some updates. And I think many of us that are following the data, we're seeing that things are certainly trending in the right direction. But as most of you know, Chester County school districts are no longer contact tracing. I believe we, start, we stopped that practice. It was two or three weeks ago. Uh, and again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but as I've mentioned before, we were contact tracing on behalf of the Chester County Health Department. Uh, they had no longer uh, seen that as a viable strategy for school districts during the Omicron uh, variant. So all of the districts uh, in Chester County at the request of the health department stopped contact tracing. As I believe most of us know, the PA mask mandate is no longer in effect. Uh, that, uh, trying to think there were so many changes to that, but I think it was mid-December uh, that that order uh, went away. The CDC is still recommending masking in schools at this time. However, some additional information that we have, and I think we, anyone that's following the pandemic might be aware of this, but we'll just review this. The risk exposure has declined due to the vaccines and boosters being available. At this time, all of our K through 12 students and staff are eligible for a vaccination. When we initially brought our proposal to the board in August and we had a discussion around it, you will recall that about half of our students were ineligible to get the vaccine at that time. Uh, however, since then, uh, since the Thanksgiving time, uh, students uh, ages five through 12 became eligible for the vaccination. It's my understanding that uh, the vaccines uh, are uh, up for approval for kids even younger than five now going down to six months of age. So. Certainly, uh, as a district, we are in much better shape now that the vaccine is available. There's reduced uh, virulence uh, of the Omicron variant. So, you know, the severity or the harmfulness of the disease has ceased. I don't want to say ceased, has diminished uh, with the Omicron variant. And again, this is information that we, were, that we gathered from Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. Uh, case counts are declining precipitously. Uh, both in the county and in our school district. And we'll show you some, some data on that uh, in a bit. And the community impact on hospital rates are also down significantly. So Mr. San Francisco, next slide, please. So taking a look at the data, and we're gonna, we're gonna follow the, the same pattern that the Chester County Health Department follows, uh, and that's four weeks worth of data. So four weeks ago, you can see here from our chart, per 100,000 we were at in Chester County, we were at 1,164 positive cases per 100,000. At a positivity rate of 30.59%. I didn't include that number in the presentation, but I thought I would just share that. Three weeks ago, that number went from 1,164 down to 906 per 100,000, and a positivity rate of 27.8%. Two weeks ago, uh, that 
rate went down to 524 per 100,000 and a positivity rate of 21.72. As of last Friday, uh, the 4th, when we had the most recent data, the number went down again, uh, more than half, to a positivity uh, rate of 200, excuse me, 252 per 100,000. So you can see the rates are going down significantly. And I, I will share this with you, and I shared it with the board when we talked about the health and safety plan in December. This is exactly what Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania was predicting uh, back, in, back in December when we talked about this previously. They said the, the positivity would go to rates like we've never seen before, but then they said it would also decline at, at a very steep rate, and you can see here that's exactly what we're seeing. So that last figure I said is 252 per 100,000 with, with a positivity rate of 15.49. So the number per 100,000 keeps coming down and our positivity rates are coming down as well. Mr. San Francisco, next slide, please. So we're fortunate that we're able to get the rates uh, for O&J Roberts uh, area as well. And these are not our student rates, these are our community rates. I will tell you, typically, we're, we're a bit higher than the county. So you can see these rates here, 1234 per 100,000 four weeks ago, 953 per 100,000 three weeks ago, 666 per 100,000 two weeks ago. And then as of Friday, we went down to 238 per 100,000. So that was the first time I've seen that figure actually a little bit lower than the Chester County uh, incident rate. Mr. San Fran, next slide, please. So as expected, when we came back from the holiday break, uh, our numbers were extremely high. If you recall that first Friday back, uh, we utilized a, a bad weather day in order to take a, a day off and do a remote instruction day in order to help us with our, with our COVID numbers uh, and our staffing shortages and student absences. So you can see here the decline. So four weeks ago, we had 130 positive cases uh, in our district, and those are 130 school cases. So that could be staff uh, and students. Three weeks ago, we were at 133 in our district. Two weeks ago, we were down to 61. And then as of last Friday, 20. Uh, so last week, we had 20 new cases in our district. So again, the numbers are, are moving uh, in the right direction and quite quickly. So what does that mean as far as the administrative proposal? So, and, and one thing that I want to share too, and this is really hot off the press. I don't know if any of you have been following some of the, the legal challenges, but uh, per Perky Omen Valley uh, right now is in a litigation case. They are a school district that several weeks ago when the numbers were high, uh, went to masking being optional. Um, they were sued by a group of, of parents uh, of special needs students that that was a reckless decision and so they were in litigation and now it will be appealed but today uh, the judge did ru rule in favor of the parents and so Perky Omen Valley must go back to universal masking in their school and I believe from what we're hearing and from you know what we're seeing is the reason that that occurred is because they were in the high level uh, when they went to universal masking so that being said, and, and we just got that ruling about an hour or two ago, so we had our proposal done well before that. But I do, I wanted to, to preface it by saying I think we're in alignment with something that it, that's, that's doable and that I think legally we would be able to do as well. So our administrative masking proposal uh, would be that masks are required when the Chester County transmission level is in the high rate. And currently we are, we are in the high rate. Next, we would recommend, we would, masks would be recommended, but not required once Chester County transmission levels are insubstantial. So if you remember the initial plan that we did uh, back in August, in order for masking to be recommended, we had to be in the moderate range, which is 50 per 100,000 or lower. So what we're essentially doing is we're doubling that and we're saying as long as we come out of high, if we're in the substantial range, that our proposal would be mass being recommended uh, but not required at that rate and then masking in our district would be optional and i think it's very important to point out the language here too the reason i said re or the reason our recommendation 
is using the term recommended when we're in the substantial ranges because we're still recommending it, but we're just not requiring it at that point. I know in districts that have used that language, they still have a large majority of students that are choosing to wear the mask under that. So we want to use that language recommended, but it would be exactly that. It would be recommended, not required. Once we would get below the substantial rate, then we would move into mass optional. And again, I think it's, it's essentially the same thing, but I think the terminology matters because the recommended language is the exact same language that the CDC is currently using. I also want to remind folks that um, the federal order for fa uh, face masks being worn on public transportation is still in effect. Uh, they did extend that. It's my understanding that they're going to be reevaluating that sometime in March. Uh, but right now, even if we get to the point at OJR where we're at a level where the masks become recommended or optional, um, we would still have to wear them on the buses because that's a federal order until that goes away. So the last slide we have is really just our revised graph that we would put in there. And so you can see uh, it's what I just went over, but when we're in the high range, and we also included the metrics for the high range, and the high range is 100 or more per 100,000. And then you can see the positivity rate of in the high range is anything over 10%. You can see then the substantial range, you know, what the incident rates are, what the positivity, and then moderate and low. And again, just to reiterate, this is a change from our current health and safety plan, which requires masking in both the high and substantial range. And our proposal here, once we got in the substantial, masking would be recommended. Thank you. It's my information for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Stout. Um, so we'll open up for board discussion here. Um, I'll start off just a couple of quick questions. Yep. Um, one is I know the, the, we just an hour ago got the legal uh, that, that Perk Valley lost their, their case and was one of the drivers they did not have any metrics for, for that. And do we feel like after we've talked to our attorneys that we have your recommendation feels like we're on solid footing. Yeah, Mr. Fitzgerald is with us this evening uh, for a few minutes, and I also talked with uh, Mr. Subers, both of our attorneys. And Mark, I can let you speak about that. Great. In, in short, yes. Um, just for the board's <clears throat> own understanding of where, where we stand, there are, as we understand it, four cases in the Commonwealth on this very issue, two in Western Pennsylvania and two, two within our area, um, North Allegheny School District, Upper St. Clair School District, <coughs> Perk Valley, and Springfield, Delaware County. In all four cases, um, there were splits. In the Western part of the state, one judge said mask optional is legally uh, appropriate where another judge said otherwise. Same here in the East, Judge uh, Beetlestone uh, indicated that based on the, the, the uh, concerns raised by parents under Section 504 and IDEA, the, the uh, masking decision of Perk Valley was found to be um, illegal. Uh, but that was different in Springfield, Delaware County. So what we have is we have the courts all over the place. What's different about what you're proposing versus what has gone on with the previous four cases is the, the, the metrics that are, are aligned to uh, the decision to go mask optional. That did not occur in any of the other matters. Um, I think another driving factor is how the timing in which you are uh, rolling this out. For all four districts, it appears that timing was a problem in part because it was occurring as a surge was occurring with regard to the virus. So while the decision in, with regard to Perk Valley um, came out today and, and throws some caution with regard um, to potentially relaxing some of the um, um, regulations, I see it as, as, as completely distinguishable and should not change the, that approach should the board decide to go that route. Thank you. I have a question. Um, would the recommendation for the going into substantial, going to recommendation, recommended and um, moderate go to optional, 
would there be sustainment for that metric like two weeks in substantial three weeks in substantial or would it be immediate well, we would need to determine that my initial thinking is it would be immediate uh, we would like to move there once the numbers come down just because they're trending down so steeply um, I know there are two districts in, in Chester County that do have a two-week window. Um, some of my other colleagues are saying as soon as the number gets to whatever their board determines, they want to make the move. And that would be my proposal as well. Um, what did you say was, oh, go ahead. You go more. I'm sorry, I just want to ask the why behind, like why would you recommend immediate versus a two-week sustained? I just think the way the numbers are trending down, we're going to see them trend down. I don't think we're going to see them trend up like that. If we would get to a point where we do see the numbers start trending up, we would have some language in our plan that uh, if, there's a, if, there's a, if there's a mandate, if the numbers get high, if there's a, a strong recommendation that we could always re-implement the mask. But once the number gets down where we don't have to wear them, I, would, I, I want to stop wearing them at that point. What did you just say our most recent um, positivity rate was? Uh, our most recent, uh, now this is Chester County, 15.49. Okay, so I'm assuming that with this proposal, you'd have to meet both the, the case number and the 8 to 9.9% .9 positivity you would, rate. You would have to, to meet both. And that's really a CDC chart that has not been um, adjusted. Um, if they would make an adjustment to it, we would follow that. But uh, that CDC chart is based off of communicable diseases, not just COVID. So they, they've been very hesitant to change the chart and those metrics. Is there any way we could also consider the cases within the district? We have 20 cases in a week. If we have 10 cases in a week, but Chester County still at a higher rate, when you think that it might be prudent to let the children have that decision to be made with the parents? I haven't considered that. Um, we've been relying on the Chester County rate, so that, that's what I wanted to stay with. Um, so I, I, I don't yeah. know. Well, the only reason I just bring that up is I know everyone knows that children are not wearing masks anywhere except for school. Yep. And for some families, that's still not, they still aren't satisfied with that. I know there's a difference of opinions on it, but parent, you know, parents do have always had the choice to have their child wear a mask if they want to. And Children in school have not had the choice not to. The only other thing I would like to say, Mrs. DiMarino, regarding, regarding that number that I said that the district uh, cases, that number is likely to go up slightly because sometimes parents won't be reporting uh, until sometime this week. So then we would go back and add it to that week. So if you follow these numbers closely, like some people do, that two weeks ago, uh, our numbers were lower, but they ended up at 61. I think they were in the 50s, but they ended up 61 mm -hmm. as we got reports that came in. So sure. we're at, I don't see it going from 20 to 60, but that could go up to 25 uh, or 28 in the next week. So, so given that, just to, I think, uh, Lydia's point on making sure we have that fully reported before we take action, I think if we could make sure that our, however we write this proposal when it goes to the board meeting, that we consider that um, we don't take an action that could be on an adjusted a number that could then subsequently be adjusted. Plus this Correct. 20 is school, not, not community. Correct. That's 20 in school. So again, and you need to rely on what's reported exactly. uh, in so that case. So the numbers are higher than that in actuality, in our community. Absolutely. These are school numbers that are reported. Right. Yeah. Dr. Stout. What is the population of our district, students and teachers? The population of our district? Yeah. So 5,300 students. Kathy, you're down the end. How many staff? I'm going to say we have 410 teachers. We have another 100 paraprofessionals. We have 30. I mean, you know, altogether, I would say we have about 600. 6,000. 600. 600 staff, staff plus, plus the, the, yeah. So it's about 6,000 total. So that's 20 positives over about 6,000. Correct. Okay. But that, that's in school, so it's not, the, school. it's not the total universe of kids that have it. If you have it outside of school, so it's not the full population. Correct. It, it's, it's folks that were in school, in too. School, so if you right, were out not, of school for a time period. Not the population it, of the district. 
No, no, but no. It's not population this, of people it's not, in school. No, it's uh, while they were they were attending school. If I if I as a student tested positive but was not in school when I tested positive, it's not in a number. That's what makes sense. Okay. Gotcha. Right. So it's not a, it's it's more a measure of school exposure, not Correct. a measure of all the student population who have tested positive for COVID. So for instance, if a child took a home test and the parents didn't report it to the district, that wouldn't be counted in that number. Correct. It would not. Or if a student who was was let me get this correct, and I may need uh, Dr. Marchini to help us out. If a student was not in school, and I'm not, not sure what length of time, but was positive, as long as they weren't in school, that would not be attributed to this number. So it's, it's case contacts of people that were in school, positive that were in school. Okay. I would um, like to just ask for the consideration of at least the sustained two weeks, because there's a double whammy there for me around... Um, the non-reported cases, as well as we require sustainment to require masks. We wanted three weeks of sustained numbers in order to mask kids. We should at least have two weeks of sustained numbers to unmask kids, um, in my opinion. I'm open to the um, making it recommended based on all the variables, sorry, all the variables you presented and what we're hearing and the reduction and the now people can get vaccinated. So I, I understand all that, but I would like some sustainment. Yeah, that and Lydia, that was in my our initial proposal when we first considered it. And then, like I said, after talking with some of my colleagues, I think only two were looking for a, a sustained amount of time. So, so that's why my proposal came in. It if we get to that level on a Friday, that we would move. But if, if the board would like to see two weeks worth of that data, that's something we could put in. I'm one voice. Right, I'm I sure know, others I disagree with me. Yeah. But I would um, actually, I think what you're saying is important, Lydia, because we want to make sure it's not an anomaly just of that week. And we didn't have people who are traveling on vacation or people who were driving that number lower within the county. Um, but I think having some sort of sustain sustainability to make sure it's not an anomaly is not a bad thing before we make this move. Additionally, you know, if the numbers are down on a Friday, Kids go home wearing a mask, and there's no preparation for them to, I guess, seek other kids without a mask. So I'm not sure two weeks is what the number should be, but I should. I don't think it should be immediate. Just maybe a little bit of leeway time, like a week or two. Dr. Stout, can you clarify for me? Um, you mentioned something earlier about uh, the vaccines being approved for uh, age as young as six months yeah now i just heard that on the news okay. and that was last week that right. they're taking it to uh the fda for approval and they expect to get that relatively soon right so if that happens an argument i continually hear about the masking is that there's vulnerable populations not eligible for the vaccine at the at this point so if that was to go forward then tell me what is the argument for keeping the mask required it's a good question Okay. So another question I had is, given that a lot of things I'm reading about this is that this is now moving into the endemic level, are we going to continue to deal with this year after year? I mean, there's got to be a stopgap included in this somewhere. I mean, I don't think this is a sustainable position to continue to have to revisit case numbers and, and you know, infections in the school and community. I mean, this isn't any way to continue to, to run a school district. So what, what kind of what can we build into this plan to ensure that, given that this is going to move into an endemic level, uh, something we'll deal with every year? I mean, I, I just don't think it's feasible to have to continue to look at masking and non-masking every year. Well, and I, I believe too, you know, when we get into that en endemic stage, you, you would you would expect to see some some changes made by the CDC and also the Chester County Health Department in, in how we deal with this moving forward. Um, so again, I mean, you know, I mentioned it earlier about a couple of these districts that went a little too soon and are finding themselves in hot water. Um, but there are some districts that, that have just taken a, a timetable. I know there's one district in the county that said February 28th, regardless, regardless of what metric they're at, they're going to mask optional or mask recommended. Um, just know in, in, in doing work, when we did this plan back in August, there seemed to be a desire to have a metric uh, that we used or that we utilize in order to to apply or take away masking. So that's what we started with, with a proposal with a, a metric. 
Yeah, so this plan, though, right right now is for this academic school year. Um, Correct. Is, have we heard anything from PDE on, are we going to be even required to have a plan in the future? We haven't heard about a health and safety plan, but they, they've already opened the window to allow school districts to do their instructional plan for next year. Um, Kathy, you know the exact name of that term, of that plan. Um, they are permitting schools at the end of the year to submit the emergency instructional time template, which is the permission that the Department of Ed gives to school districts to move to virtual because of the pandemic. So yeah. they are planning for school districts to be able to submit that for next year. But we've not heard about a health and safety plan. Right, because that's something point. relative. That, that was new with the, the it's something we don't have, never had to do before. It's just something recent and we don't know if it's going to be sustained. Okay. Could you tell us uh, what CHOP's current recommendation is? Yeah, uh, Dr. Rubin just met with us on uh, Friday, when I say us, the superintendents, and he really said, you know, it, it's a local decision at this point. Um, he said it's really the, the will of your community, the will of your board. Uh, the numbers are coming down is that we've demonstrated significantly. Um, so that's the recommendation coming from the policy lab. Now, you know, he's saying, you know, and the policy lab saying, you know, if you're in a community where the numbers are, are high or rising, you certainly don't want to do it. But if you're in a community that has a high vaccination rate, that the numbers are coming down, that uh, it's something to consider, but it's based on the community. But they wouldn't recommend it if we're in high. Is that what you just said? I will tell you, Dr. Rubin said, like it's up, it's up, it's up to the district, but I have pressed him for a metric and the metric that he shared, he goes 100 would be good. 100, okay. Yeah, if we need a metric, but he said if districts, the numbers are going down and district mm -hmm. says we don't want to apply a metric, right. they're, they're okay with that. And the 100 is what you're recommending in this. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a projection on the time frame of when we would hit that level? Based on the, uh, the counts coming down? Yeah, if the numbers keep halving the way they are, it could be within two weeks. But again, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. What's our procedure as far as um, this plan? If we uh, like this plan, we're not obviously voting on this plan tonight. Correct. So we'll, we'll bring it to the board in two weeks because we would have to make an, a change to the plan. And then if it gets board approved, then that's the, the plan we would follow. In which case, at that point, we might be able to enact it immediately because we might be down that low. We could. Right. Hmm. You could take the mask off at mid-meeting, maybe, <laughs> depending on how it goes. So I would say just just to you know um, bring the board discussion. I I think we should look for if there's some consensus guidance we could give to Dr. Stout. If I don't know if there is or not, I'm just you know if 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 people feel like um, reason is this a reasonable recommendation that there's the um, guidance with CHOP. Um, I think I've heard that maybe making sure those numbers are either sustain, I don't know if sustains the right term or a, a period of time so we don't know they don't get adjusted and are to continue to head down. So if building in that little sort of cushion of data time so it's not a anomaly, um, is that a, a consensus that the, the majority of the board here would feel? I am, um, I, I, I might have term? a different opinion, but um, I think if our numbers keep projecting down like they are, I. I think, and CHOP is recommending what you're saying, then I, I think I would be on board with moving and not waiting um, because the numbers are halving every single week, um, if not greater than that. Um, so I, I, would, I would support. What's Just the, going right immediately. Like. Yeah. yeah. I would agree with that. Everyone knows how I feel about this, so I won't go on. But, um, you know, I really feel like our community has endured a lot of Let's change the metrics again. Oh, we're gonna now we're gonna go with this number. Now we're gonna go with that number, to, to kind of make it. You know, we were first you know wanting everyone to be vaccinated, then everyone was vaccinated, and we're still doing this. So I feel like um, this recommendation, if we're gonna go with it, we should just go with it the way it is and not um, continue to keep changing it. And maybe in two yeah, weeks, well, I mean, like by saying the two weeks or whatever, like if it trends up, to, you know, two weeks, like that kind of thing. That was my point, though, Kathy, is we haven't changed that. Like we, in order to mask kids, we were at three weeks of a sustained rate. So to unmask, to just do immediate feels counterintuitive to me. That said, 
if we see the doubling of the decrease, then that's the right trend. And I'm fully in support of like then implementing it. I just wouldn't want it. To, for me, it feels odd to go from Friday as the number and then Monday, no masks. If it's the next Friday, that feels a little bit better to me. But again, I am one voice and I'm totally fine with being the only one thinking that way. It wouldn't be one day either. We would wait for the numbers to come out on Friday, correct? Correct. So we would have the week of the numbers. It wouldn't, we wouldn't have gone from like Friday we got numbers and Monday they would be. Like, because you would Isn't already have the week of the Right, the numbers come project. out on Friday. Right. It, would be a, it would be a culmination of that, that, that entire, entire week. It would be, the it would be a week's worth yeah. of week's worth yeah. yeah. And since we don't then, vote don't on this until up, you said? two weeks from now. What's that? Didn't you say when reporting them comes back in, it sometimes goes back up? Or is that just ours? That's just ours. That's just our school. OK, never mind. Yeah. Then I could be convinced. Yeah, our, our, our district was, our district typically has been just a little bit higher than the county. And last week was the first time we were a little bit lower than the county. But I think it, the trend is the same of our district and the county. They're all, they're both trending in the same direction, so. the same rate. As long as that trend is there. I just feel yeah. like we, to your point, like we keep talking about this. And to be honest, we've had a plan in place for a year. Like we should just be working the plan. Now, we did commit that, okay, we're seeing different things, more people are getting vaccines, so should we reconsider the plan? That's what we're doing right now. Right. And since it is going down and down and down, then yeah, okay, we're reconsidering it. And we are taking, well, you're recommending that we take the substantial from re uh, mandated to recommended. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that's in the direction that I think a lot of the community would like to go. <clears throat> so, so be it, and to the point of recommended, Parents and kids who still want to be masked can still be masked, and Omicron's not as um, hurtful or as severe as the reg as the other variants right. have been. Right. Yep. I just want to be careful that we're not. My only caution was so that we're not swinging a different direction now, and we just keep staying like. To, and to your point, like don't stop, keep stop, keep talking about it. Like we got our plan, let's follow our plan. <laughs> That's where I'm at. However, I say that with the fact that. Yeah, we have changing circumstances. We now have everybody can be vaccinated. This isn't as severe, so I'm good. I'm over saying that. Sorry, <laughs> you're, you're good. Thank you. I'm, per, I'm per, I mean, to, to your point, Lydia, I, I'm persuaded that we know a lot more now. We know that we know this Omicron variant is, is, you know, less aggressive. And we've learned a lot about this, this thing. And I think it will become just a seasonal something. And we're not going to be living with masks in the future other than optional. I think culturally we'll have them and, you know, people will continue to wear them. But, I, you know, unless something changes, which I've been really wrong on this one a lot. So I don't think, you know, we all thought we were going to start this school year with no masks. I mean, last summer we were meeting here, we had no masks. So I imagine my gut tells me we'll be in this summer, we will not be meeting with, with masks on, you know. So I, you know, I think I think it makes sense. I think let's move it forward, and I think um, you know I think we're going to get there to to next school year. But I think let's we've been good being sort of like this pragmatic and incrementalist board and kind of moving, you know, not at the bleeding edge of stuff, but also kind of making informed decisions we go. And I think it's served us well, um, and I think that's what you're proposing. So I'm for it. I think, we, I think we've tried. We've tried to do that. Um, you know, we, we've tried to stay true with the, the the CDC or Chester County Health Department. But even our our current uh, table that we have, we did stray away from them. I mean, because the CDC says mask recommended in schools at all times. So even our proposal we did back in August, I think we applied some common sense to it. Unfortunately, there was a mandate there, and the numbers were high the entire time. And then when the mandate went away, then the numbers just skyrocketed with, with Omicron, but we're trending in the right direction now. And I think, I think we all want to get to a point where, where we can resume school as normal. As and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, you know, that CHOP is along with this. Because, yeah. you know, with the Chester County Health Department, with the CDC, you know, there's been a lot of miscommunication. And sometimes I wonder what they're thinking, but you know, CHOP's been pretty consistent in, in applying the signs to, to their decision. So, yeah, I'm, I'm good with the decision, too. And right in the predictions. Yes. Yes, they said yeah. it's going to go yeah. up fast and it's coming down fast. So, actually, on that point, um, do we have language in our, can we change the language in the health and safety plan and reflect that we prefer to follow the guidelines coming out of CHOP rather than the CDC? 
It's, it's my understanding, and I've got to apply some history here that I wasn't here last year, but I believe when, when we were first dealing with this, CHOP seemed to be more stringent than any place else. So they've come around, uh, which, which is what I really like about their approach. And Dr. Rubin, when he meets with us, as the virus adapts, they seem to be adapting their methods, uh, unlike some other larger organizations, maybe. So, um, there were a number of us that argued for us to follow CHOP, but we lost that argument. Right, but and right, they were more strict because they were uh, originally, strict. but they're, they're coming around. So, so it's um, like pick a, pick a body you want to follow. I like CHOP only because they're pediatricians and they're doctors versus some of the other groups that we're following. And the CDC right. recommendations are countrywide versus this is a more local. Um, so I think that and it's something where it's a very world-renowned, you know, hospital for, for kids. So I think it's something really good to follow and pay attention to for sure. Yeah. Well, one of the things we could do, Mr. Doherty, is we could put in our plan that because right now I think we say CDC, Department of Health, and uh, Chester County Health Department, I think we could put, or Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, we could just add, add them in as a resource, because they're ones that I look at quite frequently. Yeah, and I think that's true, because we have been talking to them a lot and following their advice, so I think <clears throat> putting that in the plan, and, you know, and again, we're free to kind of move, I think using, trying to use common sense and pragmatism as we do that, I think it's good, so I, I, I think that's a good idea throwing that in there. So uh, our metric right now would be Chester County transmission level. And we've been shadowing that for the most part. Let's just say something strange happens where the Chester County levels come down, but we find that the ONJ Roberts levels, for whatever reason, start skyrocketing. Um, would there be some kind of stopgap to reverse that where we might, you know, jump back into a more rigid plan if we, see, if we see some elevation there. In our original plan, we weren't planning to put the, that contingency in because we've, we've mostly been using the Chester County health rate. Because keep in mind, we have a number of staff members that may not live in our district, may live in the county, may actually even live in, in Montgomery County. So by casting that county net, I think it gives us a, a broader data scope to apply. Right, right. But I think, you know, as a board, we're here to protect the children in our district. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if we didn't have some kind of, you know, if something, you know, unforeseen happened where our, you know, in school transmission started to skyrocket and we're like, well, the county's low, we got to stay with the plan. I think that would be. You yeah. I, just don't be comfortable you, with that. So okay. just just so I think, um, as we were part of the board when we first did this, um, there is a, a scop gap, which is Dr. Stout has the authority to change the plan and to put those measures in place as he sees fit, and then inform the board, and we can just yeah. talk about it after the fact. So he, at any time, um, Dr. Stout can step in and make amendments to the plan as needed. You know, if if the circumstance dictated. Correct. Yeah, there's language in the health and safety plan that grants the superintendent that authority. So if we would have a breakout in a school or a classroom, we can adjust accordingly. And that would have to go through board approval again, or yeah. that would be immediate? It would be part of the health and safety okay. plan. That what we're going to bring, this is just the overview. We'll bring the entire health and safety plan to you for approval, but it'll have that same language in there. Okay. Yeah. Another question off the top of topic of masks. Um, I noticed the health and safety plan does still say that there's no water fountains allowed to be used. Are the water fountains being used? Or can we change that and get them back in use? That's a good question. Rich, do you know that one? The bottle fillers. Bottle we have the bottle the fillers. Bottle fillers. Bottle fillers. Bottle fillers. Like, like, like with young children, you know, like first the grade. bottle dispensers are in use throughout the schools. But the water fountains are not? Correct. So elementary school students who might not be carrying a water bottle around necessarily after gym class or whatever don't have a water fountain available. Is that true? They Unless they go to the nurse's office for a cup? No, they, yeah. they regularly bring water, their water bottles to their physical education classes. So that's a, that's a natural. That's what they do now. That's great. But could we turn the water fountains back on? Uh, it's something that we can consider. I don't know what the recommendation is uh, with that at this time. I mean, I know early on touch, touch surfaces, and, but I'm not sure where we're at now. You do anything you want? Yeah. 
Yeah, we're in charge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything you want, Mr. Mayor? Okay. I heard that. I almost, <laughs> I almost think the water fountains are a recommendation to get rid of for germs and kids no matter what. Yeah. I see them getting rid of them anywhere. It had nothing, nothing to do with COVID, but like, I'm not sure I'd want to drink. Yeah. Well, no, know. I'm just thinking the little first grade boy who's sweating profusely after running around like in gym class, you know, they should have a water fountain. They definitely don't deny I'm coming from a first, second, and third grade mom. Like, all my kids have water bottles, and if they forget it, they give them a bottle of water. Um, and they do take them to recess. They have to put them against the wall. They take them to gym mm, class. Like a disposable them. water bottle? They give them water No, bottles? like, we send a water bottle. But so if, if, they, don't, if, if they don't have one, they can go get, they get, they get a disposable water bottle that they give them. Never knew that. So they can refill that even using the, the water bottle thing throughout the day, too, if they need it. Um, but I agree. I just think they're germ <laughs> things to begin with. Um, and, uh, and I think until we move to an endemic, I think we should keep those <laughs> not in operation. Before we uh, wrap up, any, any other Richard, comments Richard, on? Uh, Richard, just uh, I should have mentioned this before. The nurses in their meeting last week did ask if we could turn the water fountains on. They'd rather get, get the kids have as much water as possible. So I just wanted to mention the recommendation <laughs> from them. So if the nurses made that request, I think we can turn the water bottles back on so we can, or the fountains. Great, great timing, Rich. <laughs> okay. Get, yeah, yeah. I just, quick question for point of clarification. Sure. Um, if these changes happen that you discussed here tonight prior to our next board meeting, are they able to be implemented or do we have to wait to vote on the proposed changes? That is a very good question that I have thought about. So uh, as Paul said, the, that language in there does give the superintendent discretion. Um, so if, if, the, if the thinking here from the board is that these proposed changes are going to go through. If our numbers did drop significantly, I could impose that language and we could move in that direction. Well, for what it's worth, I would just say, do it. Yeah. I do think if we are going to make a change that we should allow the public to have comment sure. um, before we would um, say that that's something that they And that's why we would Certainly, when we bring it to the board, we would have uh, public comment that evening as well. Yeah, I mean, this. So anything discussed here tonight has to go to the board meeting for public. And the public will have two uh, points of contact. It'll be on the agenda, and then it'll also be there's an open form at the end. So there's there's two points of public comment and at the general board meeting. Uh, too. Sorry, I'm confused, but I just thought Dr. Stout just said he can make the recommendation. We don't need to go to the board board meeting. We could just do it if he felt there's a consensus. Yeah, yeah, we can. I'm just saying, the, so after the fact, there's still public, you know, can kind of comment fact. on, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, but Dr. Stout can do that today, can make that change mm -hmm. to the, or could have done it last I week. I do it. Yeah. And it, I get everything it, I want, I heard, so. It, it just matters how many emails Dr. Stout wants directed at him or the board and at what time. <laughs> it's got to weigh that. Um, but just to the point, just so I'm clear, do, do we do we have a kind of a consensus of moving this to the board as uh, as recommended, or is there? Because then I'm going to close this discussion because we have a lot of agenda items to get through. Okay. All right, Dr. Stout, I think you have some consensus okay. there. Great, thank you. All right, so with that, we are going to move on to um, curriculum and special education committee meeting. Um, April, take us away. Uh, curriculum and Special Education Committee meeting um, will begin. Sorry. Um, we have April Sable as the chair, Kathleen D. Marino as the vice chairperson, Rita Peterson, and Lydia Stutzman um, as members. Uh, we're going to discuss tonight approval of the 2022 summer programs and a new textbook for consideration. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Soder. Hey. I'm sorry. Should I say it again? Yeah, slide it over. You don't have to repeat. You don't have to repeat it. Yeah. Okay. She has this important stuff to say, so. <laughs> okay, so we do, we do ask the committee to consider our summer programming at this time because although these are funded in the new school year budget, that budget, those funds don't become available to us until the summer, and we do need the spring to do our planning and preparation for these programs. 
So that's the reason why we bring them to you in, in February. We have three summer programs. Specifically, we have the Academic Jumpstart. This is the program that we provide for students who are currently receiving additional mathematics or reading instruction during the school day at the elementary level. So this program is for students who have completed grades K through five. These are uh, rising, rising first through sixth grade students, and we provide either a two or three week program for them. We are recommending the three week program again, and we do provide transportation for students who need it. We also have the kinder camp program. This is a one week program for incoming kindergarten students. And I do want to call attention to one of our schools. Um, there is a typo for their dates. Their dates for French Creek would be August 15th through the 18th. Just um, know that if we move these forward. Again, this is an orientation that we provide for our youngest and new students coming into the schools. Summer enrichment is really, for the most part, an opportunity for students to connect with our schools during the summer. These are recreational camps. Uh, we do have some academic offerings as well, but for the most part, these are uh, recreation for students, fishing and baking and um, kind of a, a wide variety of different camp experiences, depending on what our teachers are, are willing to uh, share during the summer. Fishing is probably our most popular, popular choice for this. So these, as I said, these are summer programs that we have offered in the past, mm -hmm. and we would appreciate moving them onto the full board. Uh, just a quick question. In the, in the past, we talked about the academic courses being courses that students could take to free up their schedule or to move themselves along in their programs, not necessarily credit recovery courses. Is that still the case? That's correct. These are not credit rec recovery. These are for the prerequisite for the next level. If yes. students do need credit recovery, what's our procedure for that? So we have a different summer school program and it depends on the level of the learner and our school guidance counselors work with the students for their recovery, their credit recovery options if they need to. Okay. Everything on here looks uh, like things I've seen in the past. Is there anything new added? Um, the, we, we always sort of hold out for the camps because it, it really does depend on what our, our teachers are interested in doing. Um, but the other programs are what we have done in the past. I know uh, Jumpstart and um, Kinder Camp are definitely, mm -hmm. with the enrichment, the academic ones, and nothing new on the academic ones, Nothing right? new on the academic yeah, ones, no, because those are really pretty much the, the prerequisite that, yeah. courses. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Oh, one, oh, sorry. Sorry. Dr. Soder, in um, looking at the summer academic courses, I know that we've offered the um, college essay class. Is so, that not included in this pile, but a different grouping? That's in the summer enrichment. That's the um, college boot camp. Right. That's what that's called. Oh, where's that? So I'm not if seeing it on the list. That's if it's not on the list, okay. they just might not have the dates yet. So okay. this is sort of our I just our I know sample. that is wildly popular, and I just wanted to make sure we were still providing it. It is wildly popular. Yes. And it's our, it's our wildly popular. Personally, I would very option. much appreciate if it was on the. These courses that are not the online ones, the math, are they, what are the dates of, are these all like uh, the same dates? They are, they begin, I want to say that third week of June, and they go up through the third week of July, it's usually a five weeks because it comes okay. right before the keystone window for summer assessments. Okay. Good. So if I would make a motion that we move this on to the full board. I'll second it. Did do I have to, do we have to second the yeah. motion? Yeah. Oh, you don't no. have to. According to Paul, oh, we don't did. have to. Okay. okay I'll record it. Uh, textbook for consideration, we are in um, the revision year for mathematics, so we do have uh, uh, one of our groups that is ready to make a change. So this textbook would be for eighth grade students who would be enrolled in Algebra 1A. So these are students who are coming out of pre-algebra and moving into the first level of Algebra 1, and then they would be taking 1B then in ninth grade. So this would be a new print resource for, for these students. The last time that we made a change for our, our algebra materials was quite a long time ago. We have had that Get More Math and some of the other digital resources for them, but this is a, a new print resource. And 
in the time that I've had this position, we have not had a new print resource for this for this course. So it's been quite a while. Reading this book has given me palpitations. <laughs> I just have to acknowledge the receipt of it. Yeah. Um, you can remember that um, all of the textbooks that we're bringing to you will not be on the board approval until the April board meeting because that's when uh, school code permits that for the first time. So if anybody wishes to um, take the time to review the book more fully, they'll be available in the curriculum office. Is this this one here? Is this the big idea math book? Then? Yes. Is that what that is? Yep. It's big ideas. In real modeling, real life, is there a way to apply and pay back student loans in there as some of those problems? <laughs> it is eighth grade, part one of, of algebra. Oh. So real <laughs> life, student okay. <laughs> is is th this have an online component as well? Uh, we have a digital component already in place. We already have uh, the online access for Get More Math, and all of our Algebra 1 students use that. That's the lab practice that we have. But it's not tied to the book? It's not necessarily tied to that book. It's the same kinds of work because it's algebra-based, but it's not, it's not that book. Is there a reason we don't have the book in the online synced up together because that that practice program provides much more than than the textbook does um, we use that get more math from multiple levels we use it for students beyond that text so remember we have we have students taking algebra one in grade six and we have students who are in the second half of algebra one uh, algebra one in grade 10 so that digital resource that we're using is for a much wider audience. That book is specific for our eighth grade students also because those students also have to take the eighth grade PSSA. So it's going to include different topics. I can see if there's an online version for the text, but um, right now we have a digital product that we are using for practice and assessment for that group of students. So, so an Algebra one student in 6th, 7th, 9th, and 10th use a different textbook than this? It, it would depend on, for the most part, all of our students who are taking Algebra over the course of two years have the same text, and students who are taking Algebra in one year have the same text. So this is a new resource for that two-year program. This one just happens to also include the rest of the content that's necessary for the eighth grade PSSA. So for example, if we have students who are taking Algebra 1 in grade 6, they are doing it in one year. They're using the same text as the students who are in grade 7 who are taking that in one year. Same as the students who are in grade 9 who would be taking it in one year. Most everybody else is doing Algebra 1 in two years. So everybody taking Algebra 1 in two years is using this book now will be using this book potentially. The eighth graders, because the eighth graders need topics that are on the eighth grade PSSA. For example, a ninth and tenth grade student who are taking this over the course of two years are going to be using likely the same, the same text as a student who is in eight to nine, that second year book. Am I making this clear? There's yeah, a difference just, in that text because those students have to take an eighth grade PSSA. So this is, this is geared to taking the test for yes. a PSA say, prep versus? Yes, yes. There's more in that regarding the, the PA core content that's on our PSSA than what we would need in, for our ninth or tenth graders who have to prepare for a keystone. Our eighth grade students, even if they're in an Algebra one course, have to take the PSSA, so they would have to take the Keystone uh, for Algebra one, and they'd have to take the PSSA math test. So there's some more features aligned with the PSSA in there to assist them. No, yeah, I, I, I definitely understand the concept, yeah. but I, I guess what I'm, you're reading on my face beyond the mask is I'm struggling with investing in resources for test taking and teaching to the test versus are we teaching the academic curriculum of Algebra 1? You know what I mean? Just, just, you know, philosophically, is that a, is that where we want to be, is teaching to tests, or is that a valid 
way to approach it versus if we don't think these concepts are relevant to teaching algebra one, but we're just doing it to try to get our test scores for eighth grade. So I, that's that's my reaction. Well, seventh and eighth grade students for that PSSA have more survey. That is that they have more topics that are on that test. So if you have a seventh grade student who is preparing for the seventh grade PSSA, that that first level algebra book is going to cover that. Whereas that second year algebra book isn't going to cover any survey topics that are on a PSSA. It's not going to include geometry. It's not going to include probability or statistics. It's not going to improve, in, in, include any of the other kind of graphing or interpretation that is required on that test. So it would be great if the students were you know, fully prepared for that at the end of seventh grade, but some of them may not be. This is a resource that offers some of those topics. And to be clear, we're not getting this book because it, it's good for the PSSA. It's a good book on its own standard. <laughs> no. It is what the teachers from that group had recommended. Any uh, more discussion from the uh, uh, curriculum committee? Any discussion from the whole board? A motion for that one. Uh, a motion to. Uh, I motion that we acknowledge receipt of the textbook. Second. Second. Thank you very much. Um, just one other quick announcement. We have a group of students who is participating in the I Wish um, program, and these students have been paired with a school in Ireland. And their culminating video will be released this week. Um, we'll be able to make it um, public uh, after Thursday. So we'll be able to put it in board line for you. Um, and they are only one of two schools in the United States who have this opportunity. And so they have been working on a, a, global, a, a global challenge and collaborating with this other school from Ireland. And so, We'll be able to share that um, that video and their entry into the competition later this week. Did you say what age those students were? High school. These are okay. high school students. I believe finance, finance and grounds committee. Next. Okay, we've got uh, three topics here. Uh, first is the resolution for fair funding. I'll turn that over to Jackie. Sure. Um, just a thrill if you recall, we had talked about this during the board meeting, and you requested that we provide a draft for the board to consider. Moving a resolution forward to the February, thank you, to the February school board meeting. Um, so we've included a draft that supports fair funding, and for Owen J. Roberts, if the fair funding formula was applied, we would be receiving approximately $2.7 more million in state funds in, as part of our basic education subsidy. And then there's also a letter. Um, so if there's any other items that you would like us to include, feel free to let me know so that, you know, after the board passes the resolution, we can certainly update the letter because we do send that to the legislators. What, what kind of education do we have to the public regarding this? I mean, we passed a resolution, but it'd be nice if, if the public would know about it and, and get behind it somehow. Sure. We could post this on our website for sure. Um, and then we could also, when you say education, I mean, us talking about it. And as we go through our budget process, we're going to be talking about the basic education subsidy that we receive. We receive one for regular ed, special ed. So as we go through the revenues, we'll be talking about each of those funding sources and where we are and where the state is. So we, we will definitely talk about it there, but that's in a, it's in a meeting, right? So people would need to attend the meeting to hear those conversations, but we can definitely post the resolution, um, you know, in our current events. And, it, and, it, and the resolution kind of goes through, you know, and you had mentioned and I don't know if I included that. I need to do that. I will do that for February. Uh, All the whereas's and therefores. <laughs> um, so more of a definition for that for the board. Yeah, so please. I can definitely do that. 
if we post the resolution, maybe include a link to something that would be a good quick uh, education on what this issue is. Sure, if you I Google can do it, that. You can definitely find millions of things on it, and you can understand what it's all about. But if there's something that's distinct that can let parents understand like what it is and why it's that's a great an idea. Issue. We can do just a small section on our mm -hmm. finance, or even in the in the current events. Um, and I think it's really important to note that you know there are winners and there are losers. <laughs> so some schools are for this and some schools are not. It really depends on where your school district sits on the pendulum. Um, Right now, we are losers, so we definitely support, <laughs> you know, MJ Roberts and, and many other schools um, who are not receiving uh, the funding that was approved by the formula, that it's not being used to it, distribute the funding. Yeah, and to be clear, there's only losers because by fairly distributing it, everybody's getting this, 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 this going through the same formula and Correct. getting the same thing, therefore there's no... In that scenario, there'd be no losers. There's no additional infusion. Is that is that? Yeah. So I so I, I would say that it, there's just losers now on some, and we're on that slate. And by doing a fair funding formula, then all the kids in Pennsylvania win because they're all being treated equally and fairly. Um, and it's two point six million dollars, which is significantly, you know, it's significant to O and J Roberts. Absolutely. If you look at that, that's our our tax increase for a year. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's. It's that significant. Um, um, uh, can I ask a question about that? Yep. Um, just j for Jackie, whatever you're providing for us, because mm -hmm. I admit I'm not fully versed on this topic. Sure. It's been kind of coming up when I was sort of unavailable to study on it. Um, but the thing that I don't understand is, so, so for example, for the losers in this case, obviously I don't consider us to be in the same position as like say Pottstown School District. Correct. Mm -hmm. So obviously we, um, we were probably in much better position than them, than them, but if this fair funding formula is, you know, used fully, then obviously other school that the money's got to come from somewhere. So that money comes from some other school district or something. Like I don't fully understand how how that would work and if that's um, how that would impact other districts that are on the winning side of this right now. And so I would like to understand that more. Sure. Um, so any resources you could provide to help me catch up. That'd be great. Sure, absolutely. And Pottstown would be receiving much more um, money through the fair funding formula. Well, right, and we expect, we expect that, I and guess. And we would expect I, that. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and this is a similar to, we the last two boards passed the same, uh, similar resolutions on fair funding. Um, if, in a general sense, there's a hold harmless clause that was in uh, what's mm -hmm. coming down from the state, and it, it's more geography than anything that's, that's driving it as, as um, populations leave like the center of the state or the north, you know, the Erie, Pennsylvania, and they are hold harmless, meaning they get the same amount of money regardless of the population of kids. So let's say they were 5,000 students 20 years ago, and now they're 2,500 students. Their payment per student from the state still reflects that 20 years ago payment of, you know, so the price per student get way up. Owen J. Roberts or any student, any, you know, mostly Southeastern PI, any of those schools who receive state funding who had a growth in population receive less money per child. So all of our children in our district receive less money per child from the state, which is all our, our taxes, than do other districts that get more incrementally more money per student every year, just simply because yeah. of, of, of that. Um, yeah, and I understand that. And there's some there's and, limitations. How much? There's only yeah. so much money to go around, and so I just want to understand how that all yeah. balances out for those districts that maybe don't have any population mm -hmm. increases, but still need a significant amount mm -hmm. of money because they don't have the tax base that we have or whatever. Right, and, and yeah. it doesn't factor in population growth. That is one of the things. That is why, um, if you are a fast-growing district, you get less per student. There, there's a bunch of factors in the formula. Yeah. And that is one, and that's what you're speaking to. Yeah, it's just about the fundamental yeah. fairness. And mm -hmm. Pennsylvania ranks like 49th in the state, uh, the most disproportionate, in the country, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> in the country, yeah. <laughs> uh, the yeah. most disproportionately funded school system. And it's and then all that money that we don't get is put on the backs of our own local taxpayers. So it's put on, you know, the burden for all of that. And and the real kind of kicker in in this particular issue is the lowest, the most 
impoverished school districts pay the highest rate of property tax. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it just has a really bad cycle as it builds on here. And, it, and, and there is, it, and it's a bipartisan thing. There's two documents in the state that are, one's Republican, one's Democrat, they're identical wording. It's more geography than a party thing. And it's more the have and the have nots on this. So, but we can post information on this for, for both you guys and I think for the public too. Absolutely. And I think that's a great idea. And I think if we post this, maybe we can even post if people are willing to sign on in addition to our signatures, ask for, you know, ask sure. for our, our, our folks in our district to, to help us out because it's, it's their tax money that's going outside <laughs> and, and not coming in. It's, it's their children who aren't receiving these dollars. So it'd be great if we got everybody on board on it. <coughs> Sorry, I have a tickle. Is the board or the committee comfortable with us moving this forward? Okay. I'll make a motion. <laughs> make a motion, John. All right, we got it. All right. It's moved. <laughs> so moved. Um, okay, uh, item two is the architect proposals for the high school <laughs> library uh, renovation. And uh, the team's done quite an in depth comparison of the different proposals, and they have a recommendation. And I'll turn it over to Jackie. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, if you recall, last year the board approved in the budget, uh, well, actually, it was two years ago, it was put on halt. Um, on hold due to COVID, but the renovations to the high school library. So we were starting to kick these things back up again and start start these things up. And we requested proposals from three very well-known um, architect firms. Uh, Murata Main, who we deal with now, um, they built two new elementary schools and they're also doing the district service center. Um, we also requested them from Schrader Group and um, Crabtree Rohrbach. So we received the proposals. They were out in the board docs library for anybody to take a look at. Um, Mike Shelgren, the director of facilities, his assistant Aaron and I independently evaluated the proposals using the criteria that we have used, for example, when we built new elementary school. So that you know we're looking for competitive fees, we're looking for creative ideas, we're looking for really good recommendations <laughs> from our colleagues. And we did, we, we've searched our whole DeVasbo area um, for recommendations from our colleagues. So when we independently evaluated the uh, proposals, Schrader Group actually came out on top. But I will say to you, if anybody has a preference one way or the other, all three of these firms are excellent and the school district could work with any one of these firms. So with that being said, are there any questions? Uh, so in addition to the, the RFP and the proposals, do they have examples of their work that is sure. out there that we can link to? Yep, they're actually in the proposals because we asked for that. Okay. And then, um, and Schrader Group went one step above and they actually, they're in the middle of a high school library renovation right now. And so they included um, some of those ideas and what that looks like. Um, and we're really looking for that connection between high school and a higher education. So we really want to make that connection um, so we were, we were most impressed with their proposal, but like I said, they're, all three are great firms. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned that they have a lot more creativity in, in what they would give us this time. In the proposal, yeah, yeah there, there, definitely, there definitely was. Are we giving them guidance on what we would like to see the space become, or are they giving that to us? Um, it's, it's a whole process, and maybe that would be helpful if we talk about the process a yeah. little bit. It'll, it'll take a good, probably a year before we... Um, go out to bid on it, but they'll first they'll they'll meet with the individuals in the high school and us, and they'll probably um, interview many different groups, students, teachers, um, principals, the librarian, the assistants. So they'll get feedback from what all the different uh, constituents would like to see, and they'll share ideas too because we really need that too. We need the creative thought process. So it's really a collaboration. And then once they have a good idea of what we're looking for, they will provide us with an estimate and a schematic design. And so then we can take a look at that. Oh, if it's coming in really high, we can come back or talk about, you know, what we, what we would like to see. 
and then it, it moves into the different stages. Then you do um, design develop or the drawings, the bid specifications, then you go out to bid. Um, and then once the bids are awarded, we move into construction and then construction administration. So absolutely, they'll, they'll definitely be listening, listening to everyone, all of them, either any of those firms would. And those plans, will they be shared with the public as well so they have an opportunity to see it? Absolutely. Okay. Yep, and we may, they may want to do, because um, the high school library is really a hub. It's very much a hub. We could even do an open, open night where we share or however, however we want to do it. We'll take feedback, and that's a really good thought um, to, to get public input on that, for sure. Anybody have any other concerns or thoughts? I'm excited to see what they come up with. So, yeah. And I, I do like the idea of getting the public in. I think when we did the strategic goal setting and planning, it was a really great exercise and just get, you know, mm -hmm. good feedback and I think it's just a good exercise to do. So I think that's, you know, Dan's got the right idea. I think doing that's good. Definitely. Yeah, we'll incorporate that for sure. So if you're comfortable, we would recommend to move Schrader Group forward for, for the high school library. Thanks. Okay, and then our final agenda item is the food service program discussion. Uh, this is not something that's being moved forward. Thank you. Um, I think we just wanted to provide some background on our food service program, just so that everybody understands how we have been operating for the last year. First, I'll start by saying that um, this is the end of the contract that we have with Chartwells in place right now. PDE requires that we go out to formal bid every five years, and then we just renew every one of those annual agreements in place. So we went out to bid on Friday, and we probably had seven requests for a proposal just from Friday to Monday. So we are out to bid on that particular contract, and, and we are very happy with Chartwells. I, we're not unhappy with Chartwells. They've, they've done a, a great job. The environment during COVID changed. <laughs> And I just want to make sure everybody understands that <clears throat> during COVID um, 2021, everyone knows we were delivering lunches, there were free lunches. In April of 21, um, USDA said, hey, we're putting a waiver together again, free lunches again for 21-22 for any school who wants to opt into it. So we did opt into that. I do. I do want to bring this up because we may want to think about that moving forward for 22-23, and we don't have to make any decisions tonight. Um, the free food has been wonderful. The, it, did, it has increased our participation rates by 33% for lunch and 118% for breakfast. So we've really seen an uptick in breakfast, which is really great. I mean, that's good for kids. Um, the, along with all of that, we have staffing shortages just like everyone else. So to make more type A lunches, it has cost more in labor, and particularly in overtime labor, because we don't have all the staff that we need all of the time. So I, and then this is nothing new that ever, anyone else is saying. And as well, we are also receiving commodities from the government as part of, we always receive commodities, which are food that comes from the government to the schools for free. Then we get that processed into different items that we then use in the lunch program. We have received more this year. So we are running probably at a break even right now because they did increase the reimbursement rate because they do provide reimbursement for the free meals. So we receive about, and I'm just quoting off the top of my head, like $4.60 per lunch and probably $2.90 without looking at my, looking at my notes for breakfast. That being said, it doesn't really cover the cost of running a full-blown, all the bells and whistles kind of program. So we will come to a point where we want, we'll need to make a decision about what we want to do for next year. Because we know, we believe they will be offering the waiver program again. We don't know for sure. We'll probably know within the next month or two. So, and I also would like to invite any board member who would like to actually come in for lunch. I mean, if you want to see what the program looks like when it's operating. 
Could you just tell the board uh, what's a type A lunch versus I'm sorry. <laughs> type B or a type Z? Thank you. A type A lunch um, is considered a reimbursable lunch. It has all the core meal components, um, and they will reimburse us a percentage for that. Normally, we have students that qualify for free and re reduced lunch meal prices based on income. That's all gone out the window right now. Every child can have a free lunch and have a free breakfast. As That's why our participation is up, as long as it's type A, correct. Mm -hmm. And we do sell additional a la carte and other items at the high school, and students do partake, but there's definitely an increase um, because the type A lunch is the normal lunch that has all the components, you know, the milk, the vegetable, the proteins. They, that, they all have to meet that component, and those are the lunches that are free. And then the, the government commodities. Yes. That's a separate issue. The government provides commodities that schools can choose to take advantage of to a certain Correct. degree, and you can mm -hmm. take some of it, none of it, all of it. Correct. And, and so the quality control and what we choose to do, that's completely up to us and is independent from the reimbursement on the type A or Absolutely the reimbursement rate, right? Correct. So it's just, that's just a different right. thing. Yeah. Correct. It's absolutely different. I will say that we're taking maybe six to seven thousand dollars a month in commodities now. We might have taken less in the past, but in order to technically the food service fund is supposed to be self-sustaining. So those are all choices. And, and you know, what are these commodities and what, how, what are the quality of the food? And is it is it like cheese and <laughs> broccoli or what? Is it um, like processed stuff? Things, not all processed. I mean. We don't get to pick and choose what they are, whatever the government may have excess of. So you're going to see, you know, fruit cocktail, cheese. There are, there's going to be bread. There's going to be certain core types of things, chicken, ground beef, those types of things. I'm wondering if the board would really like to um, maybe go and test out that food because I hear a lot of complaints about the food, that it's fairly terrible. Um, so I don't know. I. But maybe we should do that before we make the decision about whether we, you know, what we want to opt out or whatever. What I think do. that's a good idea. I really do. And, and also, I, I would be um, happy to set that up. Is it possible to opt out or just use the breakfast and not use the lunch since the breakfast is so much more utilized? I can or, check into that. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I can check into that. I mean, breakfast is minimal dollars compared to lunch. But yeah, I'm just like the participation yeah, the is participation so high. Is like maybe so that high. would be something to yep. continue. Well, I, it, just just to clarify, so the reimbursements and the type A launches are independent from the quality control and the whether we take commodities or not. Because if we just buy all our own commodities, we're still eligible for reimbursement as long as we meet the criteria. So I think to follow up on, on Kathy's point is I would love us to see and understand the quality control on the government commodities mm -hmm. and then what are our and then our normal food service distribution. Uh, system and what our options are there, just to so so we understand the difference of what's available to as we're making a choice. We're taking some commodities or choosing which commodities, or we just say, you know what, this doesn't really fit us. Sure, you know? and I, I'm hopeful that this will will get better. Um, I will say that the procurement system, as we all know, is <laughs> a mess right now. So. Purchasing inventory above and beyond commodities, which we do a ton of, you know, you're you're sometimes overordering, hoping you get half of what you order. You're not getting everything that you're ordering. It's really it is the system right now. It's broken the the, the distribution system and the procurement system. So it is a it is a juggle and a management right now of that whole process. In addition to the quality control. Our, 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 uh, our food supply vendor, is that mm -hmm. through that Ch Cheshire County Intermediate Union? Is that one of the negotiated no. things or is it independent? No, this is independent. This is through Chartwell. So I don't know if you remember, I'm sorry, at the beginning of the year, um, some schools who were on Aramark, for example, they received letters from their vendor saying, we are not going to be able to provide you with any food. And those schools were running to Costco and running anywhere they could to get food. It's, it's a shortage right now. So it's, it's improving, 
Um, I don't think we're going to see that at the beginning of the year. But luckily, Chartwells did lock down like six months in advance with the particular vendors because they're not just, they're Compass. They're a large, yeah. large company. They have more than just food service. So they have the connections and the purchasing power to be able to do that. I really hope we don't see that happen again, uh, but that's all part of the part of the, the issue right now, if that makes sense. But I'd be happy to set up. Um, yeah, could you set up some dates yeah, for us? I can set for up some dates the and then a variety of different ones, and then you can just let me know yeah. individually what, what might work for you. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Well, I'll turn it over to uh, legislative and policy. Thanks, David. Um, legislative and policy has two items on the agenda tonight. Uh, student wellness and the school calendar. Uh, starting with student wellness, if you recall at the last board meeting, there was some discussion about the, some of the language in that policy. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask Dr. Marchini if you wouldn't mind just um, walking us through the changes that we've made to that policy since the last board meeting. Uh, so the only proposed change based on the comments I made at the last meeting was just removing the uh, um, CDC model and the website. Uh, never our intention, the committee's intention was never to follow CDC guidelines exactly, uh, but they were using, kind of basing, loosely basing that model on their policy. So by removing it, uh, our policy is a standalone and what's agreed upon by the wellness committee. That would be the only change uh, as you see in your uh, documents there. Great. So is there any committee discussion on the proposed changes for the wellness policy? Chief Chair. So removing the CDC has no effect on the new policy whatsoever, and we don't need it in there for any reason. Correct. Okay. Not anything? Great. Um, so I guess I'll ask the board if they're okay with moving this to the full board meeting. Anybody want to? Great. Thanks. I'm great. <laughs> All right, moving along. So next we have um, proposed changes for the school calendar. There was discussion regarding the addition of a, uh, a holiday. Did you want to walk us through that as well? Uh, sure. So the uh, calendar. Uh, draft, if you look up top, 12 7, 21, does not have the holiday of, it, of Eid, um, which is uh, April 21st. So we had not included that in the calendar uh, that you all, I believe, had approved and was moving on in the readings. There was a question of adding that holiday in, so the proposed is uh, draft 119 is an option to consider. Uh, and that would be where April 21st becomes a PD day of April 2023, 21st becomes a PD day. And that was taken from the May 26th PD day, which becomes a school day. A couple of things happen. It keeps all the same instructional days, keeps all the same professional development days. Uh, however, just to make sure you're aware, it does um, the, the holiday there on the 27th, 28th Memorial Day, uh, Friday becomes a school day mm -hmm. of the May 26th. And start and end times are still the same for the year. I'm sorry? We start and end at the same time. Yeah, there, no there is no other change other than just flipping the PD day to April 21st and making the May 26th Professional Development Day a uh, school day. It was the only change on this calendar. And again, uh, you had discussed it, so we brought options uh, for your discussion and consideration. I'm, I'm for it. Well, I'm not on the committee, but I have a question. Is sure, there anybody else, anybody on the committee? I, I have a question, but I'm not the committee either. Do you have a question? Okay. That's it. <laughs> um, we actually got an email earlier today about another school district, and it lists out all the um, holidays. And I looked and compared ours actually has every single one of those holidays that she was suggesting that we have on it on it. 
I think the challenge is that because we don't actually call out the holidays, it's, they're all just either in service days or no school for kids, students, and staff. Um, it might be nice or worth considering. I'm not sure what the benefits and risks are of it, but it might be nice to list them all out because we do, we have Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Diwali, Christmas, MLK, President's Day, Easter, Id, um, and well, Juneteenth, we're done by then. All covered, but that wasn't, it's not apparent. So it's an idea. We might want to list mm -hmm. them. Actually, I was thinking a little differently on that. Just, um, I don't know what the benefits or risks of this would be either, but I'm thinking, you know, if we're going to be um, really working to make sure that holidays are, are people being re represented and what holidays they're very passionate about, maybe the, pol the Legislative Policy Committee would like to consider more of like a floating holiday or some sort of religious observance policy so that people who don't have their holidays represented, I mean, we can't have every holiday, you know, we can't have people represented for every holiday. We don't have any anything off for Hanukkah ever or um, Kwanzaa or anything like that. So perhaps it would be better suited for going forward if we really want to represent our diverse population or, or attract more diverse population, that we have a really friendly policy that allows people to maybe, um, you know, have a religious observance type thing that where they're not penalized with any schoolwork or, you know, something like that, instead of trying to like pull the, every holiday, you know, try to keep accommodating them. And even if, when, you know, we might get to a point where we just aren't unable to do so. You know, that calendar we did receive had their last day of school on June 22nd and started before Labor Day. So I don't think anybody really likes that idea. So um, anyway, just a thought, something to throw out. Yeah, and if I could just add, re regardless of whether we have the holiday on the calendar, any, any observed holiday that any student or family would have, we would allow them to take that day and they would not be penalized in any way, and that's what we've always done. Uh, but we're tr correct, correct. So we, we, we would honor that, um, and I think we need to do a better job of communicating that because you're right, we can't put every single holiday on the calendar correct. So, uh, but I think this is a step in the right direction, what we've done the last year or so. I'll, I'll just say uh, my two cents, I'm for this, and I think it makes sense. And I, I, I think I asked you, you guys talked to the REA and, and, it, and the staff and everybody's kind of, we're, we're in good shape here. So as long as we're, we're good, and I also do like the, the suggestion of maybe calling out, hey, this is this holiday, this is this, and this is this on there. I mean, it's, you know, I don't think it could hurt, but that's, you know, that's more just a, a nice to have, but I'm, I'm fine with moving it forward with the holiday. Yeah, I, I'll um, reiterate that point. Like, I can tell you the last holiday that was added to the calendar, Diwali, without having it listed there, I, I mean, there's not enough education happening, I don't think, among the, the public, because I had no idea what it was. Um, so if, if we're putting holidays on the calendar uh, with the intent of educating the public about these holidays, there should be better communication about it. Um, and then to Kathy's point, I agree. I think we need to, go going forward, have another sustainable policy looking at what do we do when the next time someone wants uh, a proposed holiday added to the calendar? Uh, I mean, we have to have a certain instructional amount of instructional days met, so I'd be you know, concerned about not hitting that. So uh, any other discussion on the calendar? Is there a motion to move this to the full board? I make a motion to move it to the full board. Thank you. Uh, that is it for LNP. All right. Mr. Friel, could I just make one quick note? Um, I did get a message from our staff that the college boot camp is actually going to be offered in the early fall, and that's why it's not in our summer brochure. Okay? Just wanted to make that correction. So I was just going to I was just going to open up to a couple questions from the uh, so if we if we um, 
have any questions um, for the board based on what we talked again what we talked about tonight if uh, on the on the committees that'd be great uh, you'll have an opportunity on the health and safety plan at the school board meeting so I'd ask you just if you could reserve those questions for the school board meeting but if anybody has any questions about what we discussed tonight in committees um, you know we have about 15 minutes right now we could just uh, take some public questions and again this is informal so it's not the uh, Time is to say, you know, if you have a question, we'll try to answer it to you, you know, if, if we if we can or we can get back to you on email or something. I, I Heather McCurry, East Coventry. I do have a question. I told um, I don't know if they're still on, but I told a young person to hop on before COVID. We used to talk about the summer program and we talked about the excess math credits. And we also we eliminated the fourth year because it's more than the state requires. And we had also started talking about health and PE because the health and PE credit is higher here at ONJ than it is per the state. And then we had COVID and all of that kind of stopped. So there were, and actually a couple people have brought this up where for the students to get ahead and they want to take one of the other courses that the school offers, that if they sign up to take gym, why is it so expensive during the summertime? Why do my question, because we had it three years ago, why are we requiring excess over the state? The state requires 1.9, I think, and ONJ requires 2.4 credits. So well, on which issue? Uh, just on that. That's the what? Oh, the health. The phys yeah, okay. the health and phys ed under like a, a curriculum topic for summer school, because interestingly enough, and if this young person is still on, he can address it, too. But you know, you guys also put in an equity policy. So I would point out that students that, you know, might not have a lot of money or be in a situation that they can't take a course during the summer, maybe they have to work, maybe they don't have transportation. Those students are also impacted by requiring one, excess credit, and two, charging for them to take the excess credit. So I think it's time, and we have plenty of time now to start to take a look at that and maybe make some positive change on that topic. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, what we'll do is we'll just we'll try to find an answer and then I'll ask for the board actually if we want to kind of consider what you brought up there, Heather, um, in terms of the credits. And we talked about it. We did eliminate the one math credit to allow extra stuff. So I think it's a legitimate topic for the committees to take up on a future. I guess that would be a combination of curriculum and finance <laughs> question there. All right. Uh, this Brooks Rowland, Warwick. Quick question. You're talking about the uh, calendar? Yes. And adding, uh, I think, the holiday they talked about last time they were here? Yes, Eid. What day are we going to lose? It, um, the 26th for the, what was the trade off days, Rich? For April 21st? May 26th, 2023 uh, was a professional development day and a day off for students. That would get moved to April 21st, which would be a professional development day. Students would have school on May 26th. So, so it's just swapping the days. So the kids are still out of school? Because I think that's Memorial Day weekend, right? The Friday. Is that? And the kids are out of school that day normally? And they wouldn't be? Yes. So, they, so the kids would still be out of school that day for the four-day weekend or no? Okay, so that my, my kind of my point with this is, I understand you kind of went to the teachers, you went to the REA, which I don't really care what the REA says, but, um, but do we talk to the community? You know, we're talking about Memorial Day. I'm a veteran. We talk about everything that we have in our country is because people bled, died on the battlefield for us. I don't have a problem observing holidays, but I think we really got to have this engagement that I've really been pushing for, and a lot of people in the community have been pushing for, to talk to the community. I'm not going to talk about the health and safety, I know that, but we talked about you can do what the community wants. Nobody's surveyed us. Nobody's asked us. I haven't got a survey on anything. You represent us as a district, right? Everybody on this board is elected. I tried to run, I didn't win. I think there's great people on this board, but there's still a lack of engagement. I, will, I, I find it disheartening that we're taking a holiday as part of the Memorial Day, something we've done for years. That's close to my heart because I'm a veteran. I served in Iraq. I'm a combat veteran. And I find that 
that's being taken away without even having a voice to it. So I'd like for you guys, I'd like for the, I'd like for the group to really see that engagement. I know Dr. Stout, I've talked to you. I said, I really want to feel like we have a voice as a community as these decisions are being made and you're changing things. You're changing things. You're sitting on this board and you're just making decisions and we don't have a voice. We come up here and we talk. Surveys are great, they're great tools. Please reach out to us and get, the, get kind of get the climate. I understand we need the holiday, but is that the right one? Is that what the community wants? Is that the right holiday to give, give, give away? I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what the community wants, but I think if we go to it, then you can say, hey, we surveyed and we got 30 or 40 or 60% who support this and that's why we're going with it. And nobody can question you at that point if you're not doing what the community wants. So I don't need a response. I just appreciate it. No, Brooks, we appreciate your comments. And you know, community engagement is something we've tried to <laughs> talk about further. So any other, any Zoom comments? Yes, Mr. Fries, we have, uh, we have one, uh, Naj Fries. All right, Naj, you're up. You are unmuted. Video. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Stout and members of the board. I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the community for adding Eve to the uh, holiday. Um, we are just looking forward for the board to pass this. And um, we really wish that um, we, the Eve holiday can be mentioned. Uh, great. Um, and we are appreciate for making the school district so inclusive and I do understand um, the uh, the gentleman's uh, uh, if you could look into that if you can get, give uh, you know veterans we appreciate you and we don't want to take anything away from you so if there's another date be great. thank you for your comment Mr. Friel, that's the end of Zoom public comment. Oh, we have one more. Hunter Emery. Hunter, you are unmuted. Hello, I would, uh, wait, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I was just, uh, uh, Mrs. McCray was uh, talking about me. I uh, would appreciate it if the, uh, you would consider eliminating the extra gym, the extra gym credit, so I would be able to take like, I'd be able to focus more on my studies. No, I think I th thanks for bringing that comment up, and I and I think uh, uh, as Ms. I said to Mr. McCreary, I think we're going to push that into actually board discussion, and we'll give it the appropriate uh, committee to address just that point um, and see what uh, where that leads us. We'll ask the administration obviously to to do a little research on that for us and come back to us with the recommendations. And I think the curriculum committee would be the one to handle that. I have yeah. a question, sure. nice question. Based on Brooke's comment, um, because this is actually, it's actually the right, where are you, Brooke? This is actually the right process because this is a committee meeting, we're talking about it. We didn't think of that necessarily, those of us sitting here when it was proposed to us, you brought it up, now we're questioning it. So this is actually where we're, it's good. And we do get a lot of emails that you guys don't see. I just need to point that out. We get hundreds of emails in here from the community. But then my question based on his comment and then the comment we just had is what happens next with that? Because we were going to bring it to the board for vote. Do we want to consider that further? Are there other options to consider? And what do we do? Sure. This is the Sorry, calendar we were one. looking to, to bring to the board. and and um, and. I think what we what we were looking at, in fact, I know what we were looking at, and again, I'm going on my own personal experience as being the fourth district. This is the when we were looking for days to kind of I'll call it swap out to get Eid in the calendar. Uh, this is the only district that I've ever worked in where that Friday before Memorial Day was a day off. Um, always Memorial Day is off, but that Friday, a four day weekend. So so close to the summer. Did we need that four day weekend? So that was a discussion that we had administratively. So that's why we proposed that day. But in talking with Dr. Marchini and some of the people, I know some of our families are used to having that day off. So they've traveled and did a four day weekend. But again, that was really my experience in other places, not having a four day weekend that close to the end of the school year. So that's why we uh, elected that Friday. And of course it was no disrespect to the, to the veterans because we have Memorial Day off that Monday still. 
I don't know if that answered your question. So at this point, we're planning to bring this calendar forward unless the board would, would want us to, to relook at that again. My, my my recommendation would just be if uh, you know since we move this forward unless you guys come back with something different at the which you're free to do bef between now and then but I think you know you're you're kind of and we're the only district that does that so in the area yeah that you've are aware of yeah in my experience and, and and plus you know the last meeting where the calendar came first we did did just this you know same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if there is a lot of discussion, a lot of input, we can always do that at the business meeting. So, like you said, we, this is the default, I guess. And then uh, as we get more information, we can, we're not change our, our considerations. When do we have to have it approved by the next, the next board meeting would be the first re it's, it, did that require two votes on the board, the calendar? I believe it does when we were talking about it. Yes. Right. Cause it's a policy. Okay. So we, we have to resolve it at the next board meeting. Which February is February 18th? Yeah. Okay. So, so we need to have whatever is final is, is the 18th. Between now and then. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean this, this, this is, is a never ending this, rabbit hole yeah, you can go down, though. I, I would say, yeah, you know, we should probably, my recommendation is to kind of move forward with the recommendation, but. You know, it's because this is a rabbit hole. You can continuously go down, and the calendar always does this every year. Just another thing. We're not in our, any unique circumstances here. Yeah. All right. There's one more oh, I'm sorry. There's one more public comment. Go ahead. Well, last question, then. It is. Right. Um, good evening, board members. Dr. Stout, Ms. Crumley, Colleen Blute, North Coventry Township. I've been coming to your board meetings and board meetings in Delaware County, Berks County, Chester County, and Montgomery County. And I'd like to make a suggestion for an agenda item since this is a working session to include a comment from the teachers union. A representative, it's done in Chester County. There are districts that do it. It's done in Montgomery County and it's done in Delaware County as well as Berks. This would benefit the community by informing the them what the teachers are doing for their salaries and where the teachers stand on item agendas. Mr. DeFosco, it doesn't have to be a long involved type of thing, just a few sentences to the public and to the board. By doing this, it would bring the community together, especially when it comes to teacher contracts and tax increases. Just some food for thought might be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are we, uh, any other comments from the board before I adjourn? All right, let's go, we're adjourned. That's a weak one.